We must understand what it means that the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the single complex narrative of Israel's scriptures. So what's gone wrong? Again, I've got three points to sum it up. <clears throat> First, we have platonized our eschatology. That is, we have assumed that the aim of the game is to go to heaven when we die, not realizing that the people who taught that in the first century were not the Christians, but the middle Platonists, not Paul, but Plutarch. The New Testament is not about souls going up to heaven, but about the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth, about the new creation already symbolized in the wilderness tabernacle and brought into reality by the royal priest himself, Israel's ultimate re representative, the word made flesh. This isn't just a matter of adjusting some little nuts and bolts of what we think about the ultimate, about God's ultimate future. Because what we say about the ultimate future plays back at every point into what we say and think and pray and sing about the present. No, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they were to become the tabernacle people. Because of that divine presence, they would inherit the promised land. And the promised land is seen in the New Testament, not as an image of heaven, but as an image of the whole creation to be flooded with God's presence and love. The whole world is now God's holy land, creation. But second, if we think simply about souls going to heaven, then we shrink the human vocation, which is to be image bearers, the royal priesthood, into mere morality. Morality matters but it matters as the byproduct of being image bearers, summing up the praises of creation rather than worshipping and serving idols. Morality matters because only through properly functioning image bearers will God's rescuing justice flow out into the world. But if we focus on morality, copying Adam and Eve in putting knowledge of good and evil at the center of everything, then we turn the whole large drama of creation and new creation into a self-centered play about me and my sin and what God's going to do about it, rather than about God and God's creation and the vocation of human beings within that creation. But no, in the Bible, what matters ultimately is not sin but idolatry, wrongly directed worship. Idolatry produces sin. When sin happens, it's because idols are being worshipped. That's why the Christus Victor theme, victory over the dark powers, takes priority in Scripture over and then contextualizes the more focused matter of dealing with sin. The powers have to be defeated. And the way they're defeated is through that dealing with... Because when we worship idols, we give them power over us, whatever it may be. The power which we as image bearers ought to be exercising. And so we have platonized our eschatology, and to fit with that, we have moralized our anthropology. We've forgotten the new creation on the one hand and the real human vocation on the other. So if we've done that, the result is we have paganized our soteriology. If you go to the ancient world looking for stories of an angry God who wants to lash out at people and somebody else gets in the way, so now it's all right, isn't it? You won't find that in the Old Testament. You'll find it right across Greek and Roman literature. Now, of course, very few preachers or theologians will own up to preaching the gospel of Jesus like that. They will always insist that they speak of Jesus' death as the act of divine love. But you know and I know that this pagan story is what generations of people in the churches have heard. I was doing a lecture on this subject just a week or two ago in St. Andrews, and I was wondering how I could bring this home to my audience. And that morning, I had an email from a stranger who had read the book and who told me that his young son had just come back from Sunday school saying, apparently God wanted to kill us all, but Jesus stood in the way and showed God his scars and told God to back off. But this mistake is all the easier to make because this is often how Christians have behaved using would-be redemptive violence, whether domestically or internationally, and always asserting that it is done with the best of intentions, out of love. And so people hear what they think is the Christian message, but instead of hearing God so loved the world that he gave his only son, they hear God so hated the world that he killed his only son. 
And the biblical truth of penal substitution is thereby both distorted and shrunk. And many, particularly many young people, recognize only too clearly this isn't a God they want to know. And so they reject what they think must be the Christian message. This is a distortion of the biblical truth of penal substitution. But the cross, told as the climax of all four Gospels, and particularly John's, leaves us no choice. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. We've got some fresh thinking to do, to put it mildly. 